Finding by this encompassment and drift of question where you know my son, take you as twere some distant knowledge of him, and there put on him what forgeries you please. Look, oh, marry, none so rank as may dishonour him, take heed of that. But, sir, such wanton, wild, unusual slips as our companions noted and most known to youth and liberty. As gaming, my lord. Aye, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarrelling, whoring, you may go so far. But that would dishonour him, my lord. Faith, <laughs> no. As you may season it in the charge, breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty. But, my good lord. Wherefore should you do this? Aye. Well, you laying these slight sullies on my son, as twere a thing a little soiled in the working, mark you your party in converse. Him you would sound. He closes with you in this consequence. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday with uh, such or such. And as you say, there he was gaming, there all took in his rouse. <laughs> I saw him enter a brothel, or so forth. See you now. Your bait of <laughs> falsehood takes the carp of truth. You have me, have you not? Yes, my lord, I have. God by ye and farewell. And let him ply his music. Well, my lord. <laughs> How now, Ophelia? What's the matter? Oh, my lord. My lord, I have been so affronted. With what in the name of God? My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded, and down to his ankles, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking, <coughs> with a look so piteous in support, as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak as follows. He comes before me. Mad for thy love? My lord, I do not know, but truly I do think. Well, what said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, long stayed he so. At last, a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus wavering up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he let me go. <laughs> Come, go with me. We will go seek the king. This is a very ecstasy of love. What? You give me some hard words of late. No, my good lord, but as you did command, I did repel his letters and deny his access to me. No, this hath made him mad. Come, go we to the king. Dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, moreover, that we did much long to see you, the need we had to use you to provoke our hasty tender. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? What it should be, more than his father's death, that thus hath put him so much from an understanding of himself, I cannot do. I teach you both that, being of so young days brought up with him, that you can take your rest here in our court some little time. So by your companies to draw him on to pleasure, and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean, as are ought to us unknown the fix in that. That open lies within our enemy. Uh, both your majesties might, by the sovereign power at your disposal, uh, put your dread pleasures more into command than entreaty. But we both obey. Thanks, Rosencrantz and Gentlemen, still sir. And I beseech you instantly to visit my hmm. too much changed son. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. My lord, the ambassador from Norway is joyfully returned. And I do think that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Give first admittance to the ambassador. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. I shall be grateful and bring them in. It tells me, my dear Gertrude, that he has found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the main, his father's death, and our o'er hasty marriage. Welcome, my good friend. Say, Baltimore, what from our brother Norway? 
Most fair return of greetings and desires. Upon our first he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies, sends out a rest on Fort Embrass, which he in brief obeys, makes vow before his uncle never more to give the essay of arms against your majesty. Whereon old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him 3,000 crowns in annual fee and his commission to employ those soldiers so levied as before against the Polak. Uh, with an entreaty, herein further shown, that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for this enterprise. Likes us well. Go to your rest. At night we'll feast together. This business is well ended. My liege and madam, since brevity is the soul of wit, I will be brief. Thy noble son is mad. Mad call I it, for to define true madness, what is it but to be nothing else but mad? No matter with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all. And now remains that we find out the cause of this effect. I have a daughter, who, in her duty and obedience mark, hath given me this. Now gather and surmise. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. I am ill at these numbers. I have not art to reckon my drone. But that I love thee best, or most best, believe it, adieu. Thine evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, Hamlet. This in obedience hath my daughter shown thee. And more above hath his soliciting, as they fell out by time, by means and place, all given to mine ear. But how hath she received his love? <laughs> what do you think of me? Is it a man faithful and honourable? Mm. I would fain prove so. I went round to work. And my young mistress, thus I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star, this must not be. And then I precepts gave her, that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens. Which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repelled, a short tale to make, fell into the madness, wherein now he raves and all we mourn for. Do you think tis this? It may be very likely. Well, how may we try it further? <laughs> you know he sometimes walks for hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time, I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an arras then, mark the encounter. <laughs> if he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon, <laughs> let me be no assistant for a state, but <laughs> keep a farm and carters. We will try it. But look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I beseech you both away. I'll board him presently. How does my good Lord Hamlet? Well, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent, well. You're a fishmonger. Oh, aye, my lord. <laughs> I never do so honest a man. Honest, my lord? Aye, sir. For to be honest, as this world goes, it's to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. But if the sun feeds maggots and a dead dog being an excellent kissing carrying, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. But do not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it. What say you by this, still harping on my daughter? What do you read, my lord? Words. <laughs> Words. <laughs> Words. What is the matter, my lord? Between who? I, I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Slander, sir. For the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, mm -hmm. that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum tree gum, and that they have a most plentiful lack of wit, <laughs> together with most weak hands, all which, sir, though I most perfectly and potently believe, could they not hold it up honestly to have it thus set down? For yourself, sir, shall go as old as I am. It's like a crab, you could go backward. <laughs> <laughs> Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Would you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave? Uh, indeed, that is out of the air. I will leave him. 
and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My honourable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. <laughs> <laughs> My honoured lord. My most dear lord. My excellent good friends. I must not get all stuff. Ah, both in France. Good lads, how do you both? Well, as the indifferent children of the earth. Happy enough you're not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. <laughs> not the soles of our shoe? Oh, neither, my lord. <laughs> What's the news? Oh, none. But that the world grows honest. Oh, why then is doomsday. <laughs> but your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you good friends preserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison to Prison, my lord? Denmark's the prison. Well, then is the world one. Well, a goodly one, <laughs> in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. <laughs> we think not so, my lord. But then, tis none to you, for there's nothing either good or bad that thinking makes it so. <laughs> to me, it is a prison. Tis your ambition that makes it so, my lord. Tis too narrow for your mind. God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, for not that I have bad dreams. Show me to the court. For one of I cannot leave you. Oh, we will wait upon you. No such matter. I will not touch you like the rest of my servants, and to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. <laughs> but in the beaten way of friendship, what makes you a girl to uh, To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in thanks, but I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear a half penny. For you not sent for? It's your own inclining. In a free visitation. Come, deal justly with me. Come, come. Nay, speak. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose. <laughs> you are sent for. And there's a kind of confession in your looks that your modesty should not have craft enough to colour. I know the good king queen sent for you. Uh, uh, to what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship. Be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. Now, what say you? Nay, then I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen smoke no feather. I have of late, but wherefore know not, lost all my mirth, forgotten all custom of exercise. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame the earth seems to me a sterile promontory, this most excellent canopy of the air. Look you. This brave o'erhanging furrow that this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, where it appears no other thing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. <coughs> no, no woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. Uh, there was no such stuff in my thoughts, Why my then lord. did you laugh when I said man delights not me? Uh, to think, my lord, if you delight not in man, well, what lent an entertainment the players shall expect from you? Uh, hither they are come to offer service. But players are they? Oh, even those you are wont to take delight in, the tragedians of the city. Gentlemen, you're welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come then. You're welcome. But my uncle, father, and aunt, mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad! North, north, west, when the wind is suddenly. I know not from an end, so. Well, be with you, gentlemen. How do you, Gildas, and you two of each here, here? I will prophesy that he comes to tell me of the player's market. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When the Russians was an actor in Rome. The actors are come hither. What's what? <laughs> On mine honour. Give me back to the dance. Welcome, masters, welcome all. I'm very glad to see you well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, my old friend. If it's as violent since I saw thee last, you have disappeared me in Denmark. <laughs> what? My young lady and mistress. Oh, your lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last. <laughs> Pray God, uh, your voice like a piece of uncut gold would be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you're all welcome. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my lord? I heard you speak your speech once. It was never acted, but it was an excellent play. One speech that I chiefly loved. Because the nearest tale to Dido, and there about of it especially when he speaks of pie and slaughter. If I live in your memory, begin at this line of, see, let me see. 
The rugged parasite Hercadian beast is not so. It begins to kill it. The rugged parasite whose sable arm black with his purpose did the knight resemble when he lay couched in the ominous horse hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. So, proceed you. So as a painted tyrant Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter did nothing, so after Pyrrhus Paul's aroused vengeance sets him new a work. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune. All you gods in general synod take away her power, break the spokes and bellies from her wheel, and bowl the round nave down the hill of heaven, as low as to the fiend. But this is too slow. <laughs> Say on, come to Hecuba. But who, ah, uh, woe had seen the mobile queen run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bison room, a clout upon that head where late the diadem stood, and bore a robe about her blank, and all o'er teemed loins, a blanket in the alarm of fear, caught up, who this had seen with tongue in venom steeped, gainst fortune state would treason have pronounced. Yet, if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamour that she made, unless things mortal move them, not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. Speak well. I'll have you speak out the rest soon. Good, my lord. We see the prayers well bestowed. Do you hear? They'll be well used for the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. Come, sir. Does it hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzago? Aye, lord. Uh, you could for a need study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines which I'd set down in certain it, could you not? Aye, my lord. Very well. Follow that, lord, and look you mocking not. My good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, my lord. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, to force his soul so to his own conceit that in our workings all his visage warmed, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice in his whole function, shooting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing. What would you do had you the motive and cure for passion that I have? You would drown the stage in tears, and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty, appall the flea, confound the ignorant, and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears, his I, a dull, a muddy metal glass of peat, you can say nothing. Fine, so, but my brain! I have heard. The guilty creatures sitting at a, at a play have, by the very cunning of the scene, been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. He but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen might be the devil. The devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king.